I want to talk tonight about making a cutting board. You're going to dine in style. and You've got to be able to cut things up with a little more class than you've been doing. You know, those little rubber mats, they just don't cut it. Thank you all. Let's get into it. Let's make a cutting board, shall we? But before we do, I want to show you there's, there's a number of ways you can make a cutting board. I mean, it can be actually just a board. This is, this is a nice piece right by itself. It's got, you know, a little sap here. It's a piece of cherry. And I could just plane this and clean it up and finish it and go for it like that. I mean, very plain and straight. It would be a nice, nice look. If you think of a tree like it's all these tubes and fibers running along the trunk and all those fibers are running along the wood. So, so like this board right here, because it was once a tree in this direction, the fibers are running the long way here. And then on the end green, you have more of a, a totally different structure, you know, to the, to the texture and fibers of the wood. You have the end grain here. So when I'm speaking of end grain, I'm talking of the tubes of all those little um, tubes of material in the fibers. It's, it's micro compressed, but it's a lot like this. So from the side grain, you'll get the long kind of side of the fibers. And when you look into end grain, you see all these tiny little holes and tubes. Now, some woods have very open grain. So when you look in the end grain, you see large holes there, like red oak is notorious for that. Walnut is actually an open grain wood, but much tighter. Chestnut, there's lots of them. But an open grain wood has those open pores uh, that make it much less uh, smooth on the surface. So if I was going to make a cutting board like this, I'd want to find a closed grain wood, a close grain or a closed grain wood so that you don't have like real open pore texture. So cherry is one of those woods. There's not a lot of open pores on the surface here. Um, hard maple, curly maple is another one. Uh, like I said, walnut is an open grain wood, but it's pretty tight for an open grain wood. So what I'm going to make is an end grain cutting board. So when you're cutting, you're not cutting across the grain like this. You're cutting actually down into the fibers. It gives you a very different action with the knife. The knife can almost get stuck in there a little bit. But because of the nature of the composition of it, the knife slices and then it sort of heals itself. It's also much harder material than the side grain. True butcher block table is not side grain. Sometimes people call it because they glue up a bunch of strips laying like this. A true butcher block is when all of the blocks on the table are oriented so the end grain is facing up. So those massive tables that you know butchers would use and they take the cleaver and smack down into it, They'd be hitting into the end grain of hard maple, usually, or beech, or something like that. Really tough stuff, and it could last for years. I'm not a huge fan of side grain cutting boards for that reason. If I could make one, I prefer the end grain, because it's like you have a mini butcher block on your counter. Here is an end grain cutting board. Check that out. And this is what I want to show you how to make tonight. So I said mini, but it is much smaller than the big one I did in this previous video. A two-parter on making an end grain cutting board goes really into depth. What I'm going to do tonight is cover some of the high points, but you're going to end up with a board very similar to this. So to make one of those cutting boards, this is all you need. You need like 10 pieces, say an inch and a half wide, and that's rough, it ends up being thinner um, by an inch thick and about 15 inches long. You could get that from scrap. Even if you go buy wood or something, you could look in the shorts. But there we go, we've got our board material there. Now, I'm not gonna go a lot into prepping this. What you wanna do is joint one edge 
and then you would run it through the thickness planer. Then when they're all thickness, now the edges need to be trued up. I want to joint each edge so that I can glue them up. So this is what I've done here. All of these have been thickness down to about one inch and they're about by the time I joint them, they're an inch and three eighths, inch and seven sixteenths wide. It really doesn't matter. Now I'm ready to start arranging my pieces. Now you may notice here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and a half. So one of these pieces, I just ripped in half or roughly three quarter inch piece. I arranged them, but here's what I was looking at when I was arranging them. If you look at the end grain here, you can see it's angling up here and then it's angling down and it's angling up and angling down and up and down. I tried to reverse them. You might have some straight, you can just mix them in. And then you may have some sapwood in there too. I put this sapwood piece on the edge and that may end up showing at the end of my board eventually. Now this is a board that's harmonious. It's all one wood. It's all cherry. You could mix this up if you wanted and, and throw some walnut in there or some maple or whatever. After I've got these arranged, I just want to get them roughly, I roughly square one end like this. And, and then I put an orientation line on there. Now I know I can get these back in position. So I'm going to take these over to the glue up bench. So this is the first glue up. We're just gluing them all to make one large panel. And now I want to get some calls, like something to, that's pretty straight. I just like to have the clamp against some sacrificial piece. When you're ready to glue up, you got it on your I-beams or whatever the best clamps are. I'm just going to flip them all up this way. I'm using type on three, um, just gives you that added waterproof factor. If it is going to get wet, probably at some point. And now I can start laying them in. So I'm just going to turn them back the same way, same order I started. I'll just rub fit them. And I can actually line, get those lines back. So I know that that will get my end pretty square here, which will help me later. <laughs> now I can bring my clamps in. This end's pretty, pretty true. They're kind of random this end. Now I, now I can press them down and lean them on the rail and they're all pretty, flush on the top. So that's the beauty of these I-beams. And as you clamp, you want to make sure it stays down there. So there we are. That's nice. And I'll throw one more over the top just to make sure we've got plenty of pressure here. I'll let that glue set up a little before I come and scrape it off with a putty knife. And I've got nice glue distribution, not too much on there. We can look on the bottom, same thing. So that's nice where that'll be a, a good first step. So after that's all clamped up, you'll have one like this. Now this one, you notice I got a little more sapwood in it and you can play around with that. Like, you know, this, this will have a little more sap character. Now we've got our board to this point. Now we want to smooth it out. If you had a thickness planer that was wide enough, you could run it through there and just lightly skim it. Um, or you could run it through a drum sander or you could hand plane it. <laughs> but you're going to have some variation. You do want to get this flat because this is going to become the new glue edge on both sides. You can do something like this where you could plane it. I'll just take, try the number five. So I'm just going to, the thing about this is the grain could be 
changing a lot here. Let's put a little scribble on here, just so you can see. So that one was a little high. And I'm just going to kind of go a little bit at a diagonal to try to flatten this thing. So now I can see the only one, the lowest one was that white one there. See, I've got it almost all gone. Boy, that feels pretty flat. So if you're going to hand plane it, you want, you want to set your plane light like this. And you want to make sure when you get it in the clamps that you do as good a job as you can leveling it because you'll make it easier on you here. But man, that feels pretty flat. Look, all our pencil marks are gone. Beautiful. All right. But if I were to sand it, I would go over here. Let's just run it through here. See what happens. There. That's pretty nice to have a drum sander for things like that. Now that I've got both sides smoothed, I'm now ready to cut this into strips. So what I want to do is, here's my end grain here. I'm going to first square up one end, and then we're going to take cuts about almost an inch and a half wide. And those will become, those will then be flipped up on end to reveal the end grain, and it'll be re-glued up. Follow that? Let's do it, and it'll be very clear, I think. Now I'm going to take it into the, the um, cross-cut sled. I just want to create a square edge. This is the edge that I tried to make relatively square. And I'll just reference right off like that. Okay, so now I'm going to make these cross cuts, but here's my end grain. That's going to now go against the fence. Now, before I get carried away, I want to make another orienting line so I can reassemble these and it'll help me get organized. I'm going to cut them like this. So I want to get my V shape going this way. There we go. All right, so now I'm going to set my fence. I'll just go an inch in. 7 sixteenths. That should give me enough. And that's a good thick board. And make sure my blade height's good. That's good. And I'm against the fence. Now I'm just going to do a series of rips here. Okay, so now this is kind of the fun part where you get a little artsy. Um, so I've got all my pieces in order here, and I've got my three quarter inch strip over here. So I'm just gonna flip them all up and see what we got. And there you go, there's our cutting board. So we could just glue it up just like that. You see how you're seeing the repeating pattern everywhere? and all the seams are lining up, which I don't particularly like that much. And that's why I put the little three quarter inch one on one end, because what we'll do is we'll flip this guy around and we'll flip around every other one. And what we're gonna do is turn it into a brick laid kind of cutting board. Now the last thing, I like to do is every other two. So if I come up over and flip this one and this one, now these two are reversed of these, reverse here, then I'll go the same, let's see, and then I'll reverse this one. 
and this one. Okay, so what's happened is I've, I've gotten a little bit more variation and I've got the brick laid appearance, which I really like much more. I'll just show you the glue up method here. We're gonna bring up the clamps again and bring them on. So just to keep myself organized, now I'm going to just drop them all down this way. And these, because they were sanded together, they are all perfectly applied. I don't have to do this one because I just couldn't glue that. And now I can get the glue on here and really move along. And I'm just going to trim the ends here. So I would go ahead and I'd have to card scrape these ends a little bit here. And I would just use the palm sander on these edges like this. Last thing I like to do is round this edge a little bit. Now, uh, let's go ahead. I'll just show you one little section here. I have a core, an eighth inch round over right in there. With the bearing. Of course, I'd go around the whole thing and then sand. And once I've done, of course, all around the board, I'd want to soften these corners a bit with some detailing, I'd soften all these corners, and I even want to break that under edge. Now, the thing about these boards is, when they're on the counter, you don't want them to slide around much. So, I like to put these, I have, I put these taller feet on the larger one that I did, and we put a link to feet like this, and they get it up off the table, off the counter a bit, but they're a little more than I wanted for this board. I wanted this to be a little lower profile. So I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna try just these. These may not stay, but these are little bumpers for, I'll just put these in here temporarily. All right, so then that goes down. What a difference. You can get these as well. Um, one other feature that I didn't put on this that I put on the big one was these little hand holds. So the other one, I actually had it where you could reach in, maybe it was this way, I'm not sure. And you can reach in and get your finger hold on it. And I show that in the other video if you wanna put a finger hold. But let me get the one that is all sanded, set this aside. I would just use like a, um, a round nose type bit like this. I'm not sure what size this one is. You can I'd set it in the router. You could, rather than setting a fence out here, I think I would make a template that would have the rectangle here that you could um, hold onto the piece. You could double stick tape it or something and use the collar to plunge this in and just go right around whatever your shape is. You could also reference off the edge, but that's tricky knowing where to stop, you know, and then, then come and go this way. So if you had a template with just the hole in the middle that you could double stick tape down, then you could use your plunge router with a, one of the guide collars, just indexing off there and routing the groove that you want. I, it almost pains me to put a groove in this, because it's so nice now. Let's put some oil on there and see what it looks like. This one's all finished and sanded. I'm gonna use mineral oil for this. You can use walnut oil is a nice choice. It's a lot more expensive, but um, this'll work fine. What's amazing is how much this'll soak in.
Isn't that cool? I mean, this starts to go in, and I, I guess I'll just wipe off some of the excess so we can look at it. But you can keep going on that a little longer and let it absorb in there because it will start to absorb in. And this gives it a nice protection. And the cherry will naturally darken a little more over time. Not too much more, but it will get a deeper reddish color. But can you see the figure in that? Like, believe it or not, a cutting board like this would sell for over $100 because of the more of the labor in it. And it is going to last for generations.